All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to see you out here. I've got only maybe 68, 69 slides to go through in 10 minutes, so let's, uh, let's dive in. For those that don't know me, that was a joke. Um, but what I want to talk about today is what it means to be data-driven. And my guess is, either of you, as you've walked around the conference, you've heard people talk about being data-driven. Uh, you had your CEO tell you, hey, we need to be more data-driven. Uh, you have your customers coming and asking you, what does it really mean to be data-driven? So I want to leverage some of my experiences, both at Yahoo and my job today, uh, and talk about at least a perspective on what that means. And let's start with uh, kind of a premise. And this is uh, an article that was written by Mark Andreessen in, in August of 2011 in the Wall Street Journal. And what he basically said was, in order to compete in the 21st century, every company needs to be a software company. Uh, not just the Googles, the Facebooks, the Yahoos of the world, not the enterprise software companies, but even if you're manufacturing widgets, uh, if you're creating Frito-Lays, uh, if you're Walmart, to really win, you have to be a software company. And that's going to be a, f a fundamental premise that drives innovation and it drives success in the 21st century. And a really good example of that, kind of a company that I think has taken that to heart, is General Electric. This is a company that's over 100 years old. Uh, they make locomotives. They make refrigerators. They make turbines. Uh, but GE has really pivoted, I guess no pun intended, GE has pivoted and really tried to create themselves as a software company. Uh, and as an example of that, they've really invested in data-driven applications, trying to build predictive models that help them do a better job of aircraft maintenance and turbine maintenance, uh, helping healthcare workers look at outcomes and try to predict uh, from diagnostic information, where is this patient headed? They've made a big bet on this in the past, uh, in the past year, they've created 24 data-driven applications. Uh, they've launched a software development center in Silicon Valley. Uh, we're actually working with them. GE is a, both a pivotal investor and a pivotal company, but we're working to help them build these data-driven applications. And these data-driven applications alone uh, in the past year have generated $400 million. So this is really an example of this shift to, even though I manufacture turbines, even though I'm building widgets, uh, GE is really being this, this data-driven company. They've invested in software, uh, and they're turning themselves into a company that drives value not on the, the manufactured goods, but because of the software they create. What's happening that's enabling this? Uh, this is one of my favorite quotes from uh, our CEO, Paul Moritz. And what he says is, when the data fabrics change, everything else around changes as well. And so really, kind of dominant examples of this, the evolution of the mainframe really took process automation and, and took things out of manual, uh, the manual world of shuffling papers around and, and created this environment where you could automate basic transactions, basic processes, back office systems. And that created an entire industry. Uh, IBM benefited greatly from the emergence of the, of the mainframe. And there's a you know, consulting services, a whole ecosystem of things that lived around that mainframe. Uh, in the 80s, with the uh, emergence of the relational database, you had SFA applications, CRM, ERP, and the, the relational database really spurred this next round of innovation. Uh, new applications, new businesses, new consulting offers, new sets of tools around visualization and data analysis, all of this was spurred by the emergence of the relational database as this underlying data fabric. And I think, and you know, as, as Doug pointed out, we're now experiencing that next change in the data fabric. Uh, you know, all, all of the predictions that, that Doug made, I certainly believe those as well. In fact, you'll see that maybe he, he stole some of my slides, and we have simil I have a, some similar ideas coming later. Um, but really, Hadoop is this new emerging data fabric. It's this new platform that's at the center of a whole bunch of capabilities that enable companies like GE to build those data-driven applications. And I think, obviously, everybody that's at this conference sees that change. Uh, we buy into Hadoop. Um, we see the value it brings, and we're excited about building the next set of applications on it. Uh, but the market is actually showing this as well. This is a, a chart I took from Google Trends, uh, apparently good at looking at industry trends and not just whether Miley Cyrus or Kim Kardashian is more popular. 
which is usually what I use Google Trends for. But this is uh, trends of Oracle and SQL Server over the past few years. Just interest. How many people are searching for Oracle? How many people are searching for SQL Server? You know, slowly going down over time. And here's that same trend, but for Hadoop. Uh, starting, well, 2005, maybe it didn't even exist yet, or it existed in, in Doug's mind, uh, in some skunk works at Yahoo. But the interest in Hadoop has really skyrocketed during the same period. And this is really il illustrating that fundamental shift into that next data fabric of Hadoop. Uh, but this is just sentiment, right? This is what people are searching for. Hey, we're all interested. There's something new and cool on the block. But from an enterprise perspective, from a financial markets perspective, from an industry perspective, you know, is this being borne out? Uh, a lot of you maybe saw this uh, recently. Teradata announced their Q3 earnings, which were disappointed, and they set some guidance going forward that they were seeing softness in the market. And I really like this, uh, this headline, talking about the plunge of uh, Teradata stock price after that announcement. Um, not, I'm, I have no ill will towards Teradata, but I think the, the headline itself actually indicates a good question. Is this economics? Is it because in Asia and Europe, spending on IT has decreased? Or is this Hadoop? Like, what's driving this change? And I think the answer to that question, or at least my answer to that question, is yes. It's a combination of economics, which is companies are, are really looking at cost controls. They're trying to figure out, how do I spend less on my big data investment? As data volumes are growing and growing, how do I not expand my Teradata footprint and look to alternatives to support those, those data growth needs. Doug just showed a chart. Data is growing exponentially, and data is valuable. So how do I support that? And what's happening is companies are not making that next Teradata investment, and instead they're looking towards Hadoop. Hadoop is increasingly capable of supporting those workloads, the batch processing workloads, increasingly supporting the analytic and SQL workloads. And so I think there's a really big shift happening right here. I've experienced this myself. I actually, uh, like Doug, I worked at Yahoo. I had more hair and was happier at the time, apparently. Um, but I started at Yahoo in around 2005. Uh, I went through those early days when we were rolling out Hadoop to do batch processing, running our data pipelines, doing ETL offload. And in that environment, Hadoop was a nail, or Hadoop was a hammer for the proverbial nail, and it did a fantastic job at solving those problems. Uh, we tried to stretch Hadoop a little bit. We tried to run all of our data marts on Hadoop. We tried to connect MicroStrategy and do interactive visualization on Hadoop using what we had at the time, Pig SQL or Hive. Didn't work that well. And over time, we've learned, and I think the industry is learning, that Hadoop is a really important part of the platform. It's a hammer, but it has to be surrounded by other components in order to deli deliver what you ultimately expect from a data platform. Uh, and just like Doug said, I think Hadoop is now to that point where it has become a platform. Hopefully Merv's out here in the audience because I'm meeting with him in around 10 minutes. Uh, but he posted a blog recently saying Hadoop is finally a platform. Get used to it. Uh, and he talked about the evolving ecosystem of capabilities that you need to be successful with Hadoop. In our experience, there are a few exciting innovations that are happening on top of Hadoop. We recently worked with Kaiser as part of a codathon to look at weather data and internal patient data and pharmacy data in order to try to predict how does weather impact admissions into the emergency room. And while we use Hadoop to process and correlate the data, the ability to connect Tableau and interactively visualize those data sets and test out our hypotheses was really critical to being successful with that particular application. But SQL is not enough. You really need to support the needs of data scientists. So in addition to that, you know, writing SQL to extract data, how do you do uh, predictive models? How do you create statistical algorithms, use machine learning to predict outcomes? Hopefully, some of you attended a talk by Annika from Pivotal uh, and Ravi from Visa yesterday, where they talked about kind of finding the proverbial needle in the haystack uh, by using Hadoop to process and look at security log data, and then using data science to figure out when is there a, persist uh, a persistent threat that's happening? How can we predict something before it happens? So support for the data scientist is really important in this context. And then at the end of the day, that last mile, I think, is the most critical. And Doug just talked about that, bringing transactions into Hadoop, the ability to create real-time data-driven applications. A great example, American Express has an offers product. They use batch processing to mine Facebook data, social graph data, 
And then they have a mobile application and web applications where they can create real-time offers for their customers. So bringing that world of the real-time application, whether you're a developer building the app, uh, whether you need support for transactional serving to serve up those insights that you're creating in Hadoop, real-time applications are a critical evolution on top of Hadoop. If you look at all of these companies, whether it's GE, Visa, American Express, or Kaiser, there are some things that they all have in common. The first is they really started with an application vision. They didn't start by saying, I need a Hadoop. What they started with was, I want to solve a business problem. I have a data-driven application that I want to build. In all these cases, they did, they did need Hadoop. Because of the structure of the data, because of the size of the data, they had to power this thing using Hadoop. They leveraged data science. So it wasn't just cross tabs, metrics, time series. Data science was used to evaluate and create insights on top of these applications. And none of these guys were Twitter, Facebook, Google. They weren't those internet startups. These are all companies that are over 100 years old who are those traditional enterprises that have seen, like GE, and consistent with Mark, what Mark, Mark Andreessen said, that they need to be software companies in order to compete in the 21st century. So that's really what, at least I think it means to be data-driven, what it means to be the so-called predictive enterprise. I think Hadoop is a really, really important part of that as a platform component. Uh, and there's a lot of evolution happening outside of that. And I guess my, my closing thought to you is whether you are a vendor, whether you're consulting with clients who are trying to be data-driven, whether you work for that CEO that says, hey, I need insights and drive value for me, it's your turn. Go out and be that data-driven company. Form your application vision. Build that first app. Go do it and have success. Thank you very much.